Good morning, 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 saints and friends, and welcome. Uh, <laughs> Hastings Bible Fellowship. <laughs> I love it. Where you come to get your weekly dose of understanding, insight, and wisdom so that we may grow in the knowledge of him who gave himself for us. My personal superman is going to pray, and then we're going to get into the scripture. All right, let's go into prayer here. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your grace and your mercy, your peace, your love, and your joy. You are the great God, a righteous king. You're the ruler of everything, and you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem mankind and to die for their sins. And thank you for dying, Lord Jesus, for being buried and for resurrecting on the third day that we might be justified from all things for, for which we could not be justified by the law of Moses. Leading God us into your truth today, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, the Lord Jesus was teaching his people about the kingdom of God. Right. And he was teaching them about the kingdom of God for one overriding reason. And that reason is his mission was to proclaim the glad tidings of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. And therefore, the kingdom of God is what we're learning about. Mm -hmm. Where Jesus was talking about uh, dragnets and the like. That is to say, uh, he was talking old TV show, right? No, not the old TV show. Where he was teaching about what fishermen do when they have dragnets to catch fish. They are indiscriminate about the fish they catch because they drop the net in the water. And when they drop that net in the water, they pull all kinds of fish in there. When he, but when they bring that drag net to shore, they separate that uh, group of fish into two types, good and bad. Now, the uh, Amplified Bible makes it good and loud for you. So why don't you uh, start at uh, uh, Matthew 13, 47. Okay. Matthew 13, 47. Again. The kingdom of heaven, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, which was lowered into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. Of every kind. Every and, kind of fish. And when it was full, they dragged it up on the beach. Just stop, stop. You're reading too fast. See that word in verse 48. They. Verse 48. Mm -hmm. And when it was full, the dragnet, mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. they is the fisherman. Mm -hmm. Got me? Mm -hmm. All right. So what he's describing about the kingdom of God, he's putting in a parable in terms of what everyday fishermen would do. Fishermen, if you're going to catch a lot of fish, they don't just have a fishing pole. Right. They got a drag, man. They want to pull in all kinds of fish, and they want the good fish, and they don't want the bad. So you see the image he's got here? Okay, fine. So therefore, when he says, and when it is full, they dragged it up on the beach, and read the rest of it. And they sat down yeah. and sorted out the good fish into baskets. All right, so good fish goes in this basket. But the worthless ones, they threw away. Throw it away. You don't want the bad fish or the worthless fish. It's the good ones you want. And so, therefore, how many dragnets are in that verse? One. There's only one dragnet, ladies and gentlemen, just one. Therefore, verse 49. So, it will be at the end of the age. Mm -hmm. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. Stop. See who gets caught in the dragnet? Everything. The wicked and the righteous 
are caught in the dragnet together. He's talking about the kingdom of God. There are two people, groups on planet Earth, righteous, unrighteous. The unrighteous are wicked people. Those the other ones that refuse to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Well. Yeah, they're the ones who did not do the will of their father. They didn't do the will of the father, right? Yeah. And so, therefore, they did not prosper in God. That's right. Read the rest of it. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous yeah. and throw the wicked into furnace, into the furnace of fire in that place where it will be weeping over sorrow and pain and grinding of teeth over distress and anger. Now, the furnace of fire then is what you don't want. You want to be of those who are of the good fish, don't you? Yes. All right. Keep going. Have you understood all these things in the lessons of the parables? They said to Jesus, yes. He said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the head of the household who brings one of his treasure. Out of his treasure. He brings out of his treasure things that are new and fresh and things that are old and familiar. Yeah, so that's what disciples are. They continually grow in the things of the Lord in terms of what they share and in terms of what they learn of God. That's what he's teaching them. Next. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left there. And after coming to Nazareth, his hometown, he began teaching them in their synagogue. Mm -hmm. And they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers that is the source of his authority? And is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not living here among us? When, where then did this man get all this wisdom and power? And they took offense, offense at him, at him mm. refusing to believe in him. Now, why did they take offense at him? Why? Why did they take offense? They did not acknowledge him as Messiah. They, they saw him as the carpenter's son, son, Mary's boy, boy his brothers, brothers and, and sisters. Or, you know, what good can come out of Nazareth? Well, no, this was Nazareth. These were Nazareth people. Yeah. yeah. He's in his hometown. Yeah. And because they knew him as a boy, they acknowledged he had authority. They acknowledged he was doing miracles. They acknowledged all that. But um, he was from here. Yeah. He was from here. My kids played with him when he was a boy. So therefore, how could he be the Messiah? I mean, the Messiah was going to have to be from somewhere. Yeah. But remember, Messiah means anointed rule. Yeah. So how in the world could someone... He's just a carpenter's son. That was the son of a carpenter. Be the Messiah. Be the anointed king. Yeah. So they were offended. <laughs> a prophet is not... Without that's what Jesus, honor. Jesus talking now. That's what Jesus talking. A prophet is not without honor except in his own, in his hometown, and in his own household. In other words, a prophet has honor everywhere else 
Go where he's from. Go where he's from. Yeah. And look at the rest of it. And he did not do many miracles there in Nazareth because of their unbelief. All right. So, as you can probably figure out from reading this passage here, it takes acknowledgement of truth about Jesus in terms of his authority as the Messiah mm -hmm. to get involved with miraculous works from the Messiah. Yeah. So these individuals here were demonstrating. So, so it says here now, we already know when Jesus was, when, from the time Jesus came off that mountain preaching, he doing, was doing, doing the, the uh, yeah. Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. He, all, all we read through Matthew, he's just miracles are happening, miracles are happening, miracles are happening, miracles are happening mm -hmm. everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. Arms growing out, dead girls getting up, women yeah. touching them with issues of blood, lepers are being healed, demons are being yeah. cast yeah. out, wild and crazy things. Mm -hmm. And then he gets to his hometown where everybody knew him. Hey, that's Jesus. Hey, what's up? What's up? What, what you up to? Yeah. Remember, all of those miracles took place because the people demonstrated faith yeah. in his Messiahship. There you are. That is to say, they dared put a demand on his authority as the anointed king. And so these individuals. And these people. Got nothing. Yeah. So this is the reason why Jesus could say, your faith made you whole. Mm -hmm. And guess what the opposite of it is? Your yeah. lack of faith your kept you sick. Kept you sick. And so if you would dare acknowledge Jesus as the anointed king. If you acknowledge it. Acknowledge it desperately. You will be demonstrating faith. And the result is going to be Jesus coming to your house and exercising his authority as Messiah and casting out sickness, disease, and demonic oppression. Mm -hmm. After all, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and power Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressing the devil for God was with him. Amen. Mm -hmm. Next verse. All right, we're over here. Matthew 14. Again, Matthew 14. At that time, Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, who governed a portion of Palestine, including Galilee and Perea, uh, Perea Heard the reports about Jesus. Uh -huh. well, what was Jesus doing? Healing. Healing, preaching, teaching, casting out devils. He was involved in his ministry effort for a little over a year mm -hmm. at this point. All right, keep going. He heard the reports about Jesus and said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. And that is why the miraculous powers. All right, work in him. All right, now Herod Antipas was a godless heathen. He didn't have a clue. And so now Herod Antipas was the son of Herod, of Herod the Great. Mm -hmm. the, the guy who was the reason why Jesus left um, Egypt. Bethlehem and went to, went to Bethlehem. Egypt. Yeah, went to Egypt. Uh, Egypt. So that he wouldn't be killed by, right. you know, Herod. Because Herod sent his soldiers in there to kill all the boy children two years and younger. Yeah, because, they, you know, Jesus is king of the because Jews. Of the, yeah, because and, of, well, because of the wise men. Yeah. And Herod was feeling threatened and, you know, let's get rid of this guy right now. I'm the only king you should yeah. care about. And so uh, the angel... Uh, told Joseph, you know, you know, get the, that kid out of there, mm -hmm. and so they went to Egypt, and then Herod uh, the Great passed, and then they brought uh, Jesus back from uh, the land of Egypt mm -hmm. and so forth. 
Well, this is um, Herod the Great's son. And Herod uh, the Great heard reports about Jesus and said that uh, this is John the Baptist. Because you're going to read down in this story, uh, Herod Antipas had Jesus, had um, John. John killed by beheading. You're going to be reading this in here. Okay. Go to verse uh, uh, three. 3. Yeah. For Herod had John arrested and bound him and put him in prison at the fortress of Machur Macharis. Macarius. Macarius. It's going M-A-C-H-A-E-R-U-S. Yeah, Macarius. East of the Jordan to keep him away. Yeah. Because of Herodias, the wife of his uh, brother Philip. For John had said to him, it is not lawful, morally right, for you to have her, to have her living with you as your wife. All right, now what John did here is he called on the carpet Herod and Herodias mm -hmm. because Herodias was the wife of uh, his, brother. his brother and so what had happened in here is uh, Herodias left Philip and went to be with Herod and John the Baptist uh, said, you are sinning. It was adultery is what it was. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and John had uh, scriptural background on his. He used the law saying, you know, you can't have adultery and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, John stood up to these tetrarchs in Rome. Mm -hmm. That's what John did. And so therefore, Herod didn't kill John uh, right away. He just put him in prison to shut up his uh, <clears throat> uh, evil lover because Herodias was evil. Okay, And so Herodias didn't like John. Herod was uh, uh, indifferent uh, towards John, but Herodias had a genuine uh, dislike of John because John oh, read, is, her, her, read her mail. Hatred, yeah. Because John read her mail. All right. Okay, verse five. Verse five. Although Herod wished to have him put to death, he feared the people, for they regarded John as a prophet. Yeah, so that's Herod. Then. But when Herod's birthday came, his niece Salome, the daughter of Herodias, danced immodestly, immodestly, before them and pleased and fascinated Herod. And that was a lewd dance, you know. You, you, you all know about uh, it, it, dirty it, it, dancing. That's kind of what this is, you know, right? Uh, worse than that. Worse than that. Okay. All right. So much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Yeah. She being coached by her mother, Herodias. See there? So, he, so here's a picture. Here's the picture. Herodias, who was married to Philip, who is married to Philip, yeah. sees that Herod, his brother, is on the rock. So she leaves her husband, yeah. not divorces her husband, she leaves her husband, moves in with Herod, brings her daughter with her. John, being John, is saying stuff like, you all are sinning, it's not lawful, it's not moral, that you are doing this and you need to stop, you need to repent, mm -hmm. right? That's John. That's John the Baptist, yeah. So he's not just saying this one time. He's yelling this in the prison. He's 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 a handful. So Herod wants to kill him, but Herod is like the people regard, regard John John's a prophet. prophet so holy put him man. in so hold, put him in prison. So he put him in prison and that shut up her roads. But she had another plan. She had another plan. Now she has this daughter. Let me tell you what she did with the daughter. She coached her daughter, get your stepfather, uh, your uncle, excited by doing this dance. And he's going to promise you whatever you want. And when he does, you tell him you want the head of 
John on the platter. On platter. Yeah. This is the plan. This is a plot. This is a wicked woman mm -hmm. that she would convince her daughter to sexually arouse her uncle, yeah. mama's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. This is an evil woman. This evil woman. There was a whole opera written on this. Uh, Richard Strauss wrote an opera called Salome, and they used this these series of scriptures mm -hmm. for the story, and they yeah. fleshed it out and stuff. Yes, but this is what's going on in in this story, and so it wasn't just a young girl dancing; it was a young girl dancing the way her mother instructed her to do to get the king Herod around. Aroused so to give her whatever she wanted. Yeah, Im immodest dancing is what it says here in the mm -hmm. scripture. Here, the, you got the make it loud, Bob. No, that's that's what it says. Yeah, so that's is the mm -hmm. uh, amplifier. Immodest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making it loud. Okay, so therefore, uh, read verse eight. Uh, she, being coached by her mother Herodias, said, "Give me here on a give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist." The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests, he ordered it to be given her. Verse 10. He spent, he sent and had John beheaded in, in the, the prison. prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother Herodias. And John's disciples came and took away his body and buried, and buried. it. Then they went and told Jesus. All right, now a story like this is in the gospel record for a very specific reason. And uh, it's there to give us instruction, reproof, and correction. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for uh, reproof, correction, and righteousness, and so on. So this story here was told so that you can see into the humanity of Jesus. See, when Jesus heard this story, you can imagine how he felt about how John the Baptist met his end. Mm -hmm. When you read this scripture, you can kind of read into uh, what Jesus was feeling. Read the very first sentence of verse 13. When Jesus heard about John, he left there privately in a boat and went to a secluded place. So what do you think he was doing out there? It was probably morning. Jesus was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Here's John, do, the Baptist, doing the righteous thing, standing up to evil and saying, you should not be having the wife of your brother. And it got him killed. Peter and John in the book of Acts, after they healed that uh, gentleman at the, at the beautiful gate and, and uh, so forth, they proclaimed the name of Jesus throughout that region. You know what happened to them? They got whipped and beaten, beat and flogged. Now, for those of you that think that... Uh, you know, doing the righteous thing in faith is not going to get you uh, opposition. It's not going to get you involved in martyrdom in some cases. It's what we've been saying on this broadcast. There is a cost there is a price. to discipleship. There's a cost to it. And if you're willing to demonstrate faith and pay the price, I guarantee you the Lord thy God will vindicate you. He will. 
That's right. And so uh, he went to this secluded place, you know. Then neither read, read the next sentence. But when the crowds heard of this, they followed him on foot from the city. Stop. See that word cities? Mm -hmm. That means they walked. They didn't have cars in those days. You take a bus? Didn't have buses in those days. Mm -hmm. Didn't have bicycles in those days. So this is what happened. Jesus had gone to the town in which he was from, Nazareth. Mm -hmm. While he was there, he did not many works. At that time, while he was probably still in Nazareth, Herod, the tetrarch or the leader, mm -hmm. um, said that uh, all this stuff they were hearing about this Jesus dude, he said, this is John the Baptist. Now John had him beheaded. Yeah. Right. He said, you know, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Because I killed him, but this guy is doing stuff that John is doing. Yeah. It tells you something about John. So Jesus was very much in distress of John mm -hmm. and went to a secluded place to be alone. Mm -hmm. While he went to that place, the crowds heard about it. Mm -hmm. Jesus in a secluded place. So they went and they, um, so Jesus got in a boat, in a boat, and went to a secluded place in a boat. Now look, he crossed the moor. But when the crowds heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt profound compassion for them and healed their sick. Yeah, this is all in the middle of everything he was feeling about John. So yeah, he finds out that John has been killed, murdered, beheaded. He's struck at that loss, personal loss to him, personal loss to the kingdom. And so he is, uh, he gets in a boat. He takes the boat somewhere to a secluded place. When he's getting ready to get off the boat at this secluded place, there's a crowd of people there. They followed him on foot from the cities. So obviously they could see the boat and they just said, well, we'll just follow it along the shore until we... <laughs> when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt profound compassion. Compassion. He didn't say he was pissed at them. Angry. Dismayed. He could have been as a result of what happened to John. No, he had compassion. He felt profound compassion for them and healed their sick. When evening came, so this was this was daytime when all this is happening. When evening came, the disciples came to him and said, This is an isolated place, and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away. So that they may go into the villages and, and buy, buy food, food for, for themselves. themselves. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here except five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. The food. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and two fish. And looking up toward heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples 
and the disciples gave them to the people, and they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up twelve full baskets of the leftover broken pieces. There were about five thousand men who ate besides women and children. All right, so all of this happened on the uh, uh, inn uh, where Jesus was going through about John. His compassion was deep, deep, deep for people, even though he himself was experiencing loss. That's the kind of savior you serve. That's the kind of savior you're serving. That's the kind of king that he is. Yeah. All right, verse 22. Immediately, he directed the disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he sent the crowds away. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was already a long distance from land, tossed and battered by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, it's between 3 and 6 a.m., Jesus came to them, walking on the sea. Walking on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. <laughs> and they cried out in fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter replied to him, Lord, if it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. What was he going to say? It's not me. It's, not me? <laughs> no, it's, it's really me. It's me. Come. Yeah, yeah, come on out of here. Yeah, so, so Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he, Peter, saw the effects of the wind, he was frightened, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus extended his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When you found out it was me, you should have never doubted. Whether you fell in the water or didn't fall in the water is not the issue. It's me. Did I not call you? See, this is... You remember when God told Abraham who he was. You, you, you are my... You're, Abraham, you're my God. Now, I'm going to make you a great... I'm going to make a great nation out of you, Abraham, who had no children. So he finally has that, that seed of promise, Isaac. Then he tells him to kill the boy, sacrifice the boy. Now, Abraham had two, two choices, sacrifice him or not. He took the boy, took the knife, took the wood, went to the place of sacrifice, the boy asked the question, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And he said what? The Lord will provide. Now we think about Isaac as being a you know, you know, two years old. He wasn't. He was probably what we call a tweener. Yeah, he would say that. Yeah, before he becomes a teenager. And so when he went to sacrifice the boy, the boy could have fought him. He tied him up and laid him on the wood, he lifted the knife, and God stopped him. 
Peter. One of the things that Peter had to overcome as a as a follower of Christ. Well, first, how to control his mouth. Okay. The other thing he had to overcome is when God says a thing, when you hear the voice of the Lord, that should settle it forever for you. Just settle it for you. Now, have we all got there? No. But we will. He says to Peter, come. Peter stepped out the boat because Jesus said come, which means it must be Jesus. Come. So Peter got out the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. What did he do? He started noticing everything around Jesus. You got to keep your eye on Jesus. You got to keep your eye on what did he say. And so all the distractions of life don't make you take your eyes off Jesus. There's a lot of distractions in life. A lot. So. That's a very, very good point. It gets back to uh, what our Savior is sharing in the Sermon on the Mount in terms of uh, <clears throat> take no thought for your life. Stop being anxious and uh, uneasy about uh, 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 things of uh, the temporal life. And it's, uh, you know, uh, piggybacked on by Paul when he says, set your affections on things above. Mm -hmm. Right. So when our Savior says, come, he expects or he expected Peter to keep his focus on Jesus and not the distractions, the winds, the waves, mm -hmm. all those uh, peripheral distractions. Peripheral distractions. Yeah. So, so this is a lesson uh, in maintaining focus mm -hmm. on King Jesus. So, and so, what was his diagnosis of Peter? Uh, he, 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 uh, Jesus extended his hand and caught him, saying to him, Oh, you of uh, little, no. he didn't say, Oh, you of no faith. He just said, Your, your relationship with me is small. It needs to be increased. It needs to be increased. It needs to grow. And how does it grow? It grows as you set your affections on him who is from the beginning. Remember, our Savior said, on the rock of revelations, I will, uh, of who I am, I will build my church in the gates of hell shall not prevail. Here you go. Verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshipped him with all inspired reverence, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Yeah. So they acknowledged him as who he is. Truly, you are the Son of God. This is at the hallmark of confession. There you go. See, uh, the word uh, confession just simply means to acknowledge truth. Right. Now, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes. So, but do you acknowledge it? Okay. Amen. So you got to acknowledge it. Go ahead. Verse 34. When they had crossed over the sea, they went ashore at Gennesaret. Yeah. And when the men of the place recognized him, they sent word throughout all the surrounding district mm. and brought to him all who were sick. Mm. And they begged him to let them merely touch, touch the, the fringe, fringe of his, his robe. robe. And all who touched it were perfectly restored. All right. Now, where have we seen this before? Touching the hems mm. of garments and so forth. So our, our Savior <clears throat> must have shared in his gospel message about the principle of a point of contact. 
What is this principle about the point of contact? The point of contact is the place where you draw from Jesus his virtue as a result of acknowledging his authority as Messiah. Notice, that wasn't Jesus' teaching. The people said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, if you come to my house, my daughter will, will live. If they're making the demands. They're making the demands. They're, they're setting up the parameters for this to work. The, 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 uh, the soldier, he says, listen, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. I'm a man of authority and I recognize you have authority. If you, you just say the word, <laughs> You'll be healed. All right, so we're learning about what so, it means to demonstrate truth. So what do you say when you want to receive something from the Lord? Do you say, boy, I wish I could feel better? That's not a demand. That's not a demand. That's a hope. That's a, well, if I knew what God's will, I would sure state it. You see, here's the problem. You don't know what his will is, which means you don't have a very deep relationship with who he is. And therefore, your faith needs to increase. Needs to grow. It, you need to get insight into, watch this, who is Jesus. Jesus said he's the anointed king. Can you acknowledge it? Jesus said he is the Lord of glory. Can you acknowledge it? To acknowledge it is to receive him. To receive him puts you in position to make a demand on his authority as Lord and anointed king. Once you make that demand on that authority, that's when he releases his virtue to effect healing, restoration, and curing. So when we say the word virtue, think this, think this. Virtue is all his goodness. All God's goodness can be released into your life when you acknowledge who he is. It's in him in terms of who he is. Now, he's already said who he is. Yeah. He said, I am Messiah. I am the anointed king. I am the Christ. All those phrases I just mentioned mean the same thing. Christ, Messiah, anointed, ruler. Because he is those uh, things, because they all mean the same thing, mm -hmm. he then can exercise authority as Messiah, Messiah. Christ, anointed rule. And therefore, if you will acknowledge it, you will be in a position to make your domain on that posture of Christ. And our Savior, therefore, says that when you do that, it is your faith that makes you whole. That's what he thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not a question of whether Jesus is the anointed ruler or not. He is the anointed ruler. The question is, do you believe it? Do you, and will you make demand on his authority as the anointed? 
In other words, you have to repent. Change your mind about Jesus to be involved with the flow of his grace, glory, virtue, anointing, strength, and power. And they will flow to you and affect healing and a cure in your physical body. That's right. Amen. The Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11.23 For I received from the Lord himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This represents my body, which is offered. This bread represents my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you, for you, for you, for you, for us. His body was broken for us because we couldn't break our own bodies to pay the price. We couldn't give our bodies to pay the price. We were sin creatures. Born in iniquity. Iniquity can't pay the price of iniquity. Jesus was not born in iniquity. Only he could pay the price. And he did it for us. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. Partake. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, thank you. Okay. This cup is the new covenant. New covenant. Ratified and established in my blood. Ratified. Established. Again, it ain't going away. It's eternal. The cup of the new covenant is forever. His blood will never lose its power. His promise to us of eternal life will never lose its ability. We are righteous, not because we did all the right stuff. We are made righteous because Jesus did all the right stuff. And just like he took our sin, we take his righteousness. Exchange. The great exchange. All we had to offer was sin. All he had to offer was righteousness. We wanted righteousness. So he took our sin. You gotta get this. You gotta you gotta you gotta renew your mind to this. You gotta stop calling yourself a sinner saved by grace. You gotta call yourself righteous. In the words of uh, uh Mr. Hammond. You call me righteous. I'm a new creation. He called me righteous. He calls me righteous. I don't call myself righteous. He calls me. And so I said, okay, I'll answer to that. You know why I answer to the name Cookie? It's my name. You know why I answer to righteous? It's my name. You don't know your name. You don't know your name. Let God talk to you. Spend some time with him. He'll introduce you to the real you. Drink. Thank you, sir. Whew. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. He's coming again. 
Yeah. He's coming again. If he if he died and rose from the dead, he's coming again. It's still an empty tomb. It's still an empty tomb. Because he rose. So if he rose from the dead, he also says he's coming back. He's coming back. Yeah. We who are born into the we who have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are already in the kingdom of heaven. Those of you whom I call friends have not received him as your Lord and Savior. You are not in the kingdom. You can be. You should be. It's for you. He died thinking about you. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, I'm a whosoever, I'm a whosoever. A bunch of whosoever's out here. So who, whosoever should receive him, to whoever receives him, he gives them the power, the right, the authority. To become children of God. To become his kids. You're not a kid yet. What does it take to become one? I'm glad you asked. The Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus. When you're desperate, that's all it takes. If you got a little bit more time, you can say, Jesus, I declare you Lord and Savior of me. Lord, you're the boss of me. I submit myself to you. And to all your goodness. Yes. You are. You promise to make me alive and whole. Bring all my broken pieces together. And mend those hurting places in me. That nobody can fix. I receive you as my savior. I receive you as my Lord. I receive you as the boss of me. Direct me. Guide me. Help me. Teach me. How to walk in your goodness. Amen. 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 Now I prayed all that. All it took was the Jesus saved me. He's right there. He's right there. <laughs> He's right He's there. He's right there. He's not hiding himself from you. He's hiding himself for oh, those oh, who oh, are oh, in oh, him. Yeah. So come on and get in him and have him open those doors, open wide your heart and your understanding and your ability to receive from his goodness. Right? All right. Wow. Fam, it's been good. It's been good. It's been good. It's been good. You can catch these teachings on several places. First of all, Facebook. Second of all, YouTube. And third of all, Instagram. Instagram is Hastings Bible. You can catch our, our snippets, our footnotes for the saints. You can catch that there, and on uh, YouTube and Facebook, you can catch our the, the these, these these long, long form is what I call them, yeah. long form teachings under Hastings Bible Fellowship. So we subscribe. So if you subscribe, bam, they'll come right to you when they come out, and you can get them and you can share them because why? Caring is sharing. That's what sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. <laughs> that that's that works too. Mm -hmm. My husband tells my children when they were growing up, sharing, sharing, sharing is caring. Yeah. And they were like, Mom, really? I'm like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> but um <laughs> But in your case, sharing is caring. Okay. So share with share. your friends, share. your family. Share. Um 
neighbors, sure. enemies, sure. frenemies. Sure. The share. Sure. Because sharing is caring. Is caring. See? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, till next time. Till next time. Till next time. Till next time. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. How do I know you? who you're praying for? I, are you watching this? Have you watched any of our our broadcasts, our, our snippets, anything? Yeah? Well, our prayer is like, Lord, everybody who sees these broadcasts, you know who they are. You know where they where they are. You know what they need. You know, you know what they what they're seeking for. And so, Lord, I'm we're praying that you will meet every need. That you will visit them in such a way that they know they've had a visitation from God. That's our prayer. And we expect him to do that. Why? Because he's a God that answers the prayers of the righteous. That's right. I'm righteous. So he hears me. You're kind of bold. Yeah, you yeah. am. I have a right to be. I'm one with God. <laughs> so, this gets along. So, you. You be the best you can be. And the only way you can do it is how? In Christ Jesus. Love you. Bye-bye.